Right, good afternoon, KubeCon EU virtual attendees. This is going to be the uh, introduction session to the Rook project. And I have here with me my colleague, Alexander Trost, uh, who is currently a DevOps engineer at Cloudical. And I am Jared Watts. I'm a founding engineer at Upbound, and both of us are maintainers uh, on the Rook project. We got a couple of links in the bottom left for if you can uh, help you find the Rook project if you haven't been to it before. So let's go ahead and move on to the agenda for today. So also a hi from me, everyone. Uh, in a, from an agenda point, we're going to talk about uh, storage challenges in Kubernetes. We're going to talk about like what is Rook, what like what does it even solve. Uh, we're going to look a bit into the architecture as it's very vital to understand like what is even going on under the hood uh, there. Uh, we're going to give a short demonstration as well, and we are going to uh, give you information on how you can get involved, like even, like, you know, Slack and such uh, things. And if you want to learn more already, we have a deep dive Rook session coming up on Thursday. Um, be sure to check it out if you want to learn even more about Rook. Okay, let's start talking about some of the challenges that we typically see with storage in Kubernetes. So normally, uh, especially through the early days of Kubernetes, uh, it was very typical to rely on storage that was outside of the cluster, external storage, uh, which comes along with a couple problems. Um, one of them is that it's not portable, really. Uh, you think about if you have a you know a set of storage appliances like NAS devices, SANs, whatever. Um, it's, they're not very portable uh, to other solutions, so um, that can cause some issues. And there's also sort of a, a deployment burden as well. You have to you know, physically go through the effort of setting those up and plugging them in and all that sort of stuff. So not ideal. Um, it would be better if software could do that for us, right? And then also you could use um, cloud storage from the cloud providers, um, your Google Persistent Disk or um, EBS volumes, et cetera, um, and other managed services as well, which can typically lead to uh, vendor lock-in whenever you use cloud provider managed services, which, which are good, they're, they're pretty valuable. Um, it does make it harder to move to another cloud. And then there's this whole other element of day two operations of you know, backups, restores, um, ongoing operations, making sure it's healthy. Somebody has to do that, right? Um, so if we take a look at this visual here, this is just a quick sort of um, diagram of external storage for Kubernetes. And so we see on the left, we have a Kubernetes cluster. On the right, we have all sorts of different types of storage, cloud storage and storage appliances and such. And uh, volume plugins is what is serves as sort of a bridge between the cluster and the external storage to provision it on demand and provide it to applications. Uh, so that's a typical way that you would do external storage in Kubernetes. Uh, which brings us to what is Rook. Uh, so Rook can be thought of as a set of storage operators for Kubernetes, and this really brings storage into, inside to the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, you can think of operators as being a, um, you know, software for automation and an API to do a whole bunch of operational tasks for running storage, um, you know, deploying it and configuring it and setting it up and provisioning and you know, upgrading and backups and restores and all sorts of stuff like that. And then provisioning storage too, for when a application needs it uh, to be able to dynamically provision that in cluster storage and have it ready to be consumed by applications. So that's one way to think about what Rook is. Um, but it, you know, beyond those operators, it's also a framework. Uh, to allow a lot of different storage providers to migrate or make their way into cloud native ecosystem and cloud native uh, environments and Kubernetes. Um, we'll talk more about that framework in a bit. It's an open source project and it uh, was donated to the Cloud Native Computing Foundation a couple years ago and um, it's incubation level right now, but the vote is ongoing for it to be uh, moved to full graduation from the CNCF. So we're very excited about that. And hopefully by the time this recording is being played that, that we will have uh, made that, the vote will be complete and will be fully graduated. So the, you know, a quick shout out to the real community. Um, gosh, this community is so amazing. Um, that is absolutely the backbone of why the project is successful. Uh, so we take a look at some of the more recent um, events and statistics here. Uh, 1.4 released, uh, came out, uh, which is all sorts of new features and improvements um, to the Rook operators. 
Uh, we have over 7,000 GitHub stars now, 160 million uh, downloads of the container image. Um, my favorite part, though, is how we almost have uh, almost 300 contributors, uh, you know, 275 or more people that have written code for Rook, which is absolutely amazing to me and got the project where it is. And then as we mentioned too, uh, the project is currently being voted on to graduate from CNCF. So uh, a little bit more about the framework. Uh, so Rook is more than just a set of operators, right? It's a whole framework and platform and libraries and automation and functions and code and all sorts of stuff to make basically make it easier for a storage provider to uh, come into Kubernetes and be running in cloud native environments. So there's functions and and um, libraries to help uh, you know normalize the way that storage resources are described. Uh, you know a set of hard drives, a set of PVs, how much of them to use, uh, filters, patterns, etc. To say basically say what storage to include in the cluster. Um, you know all sorts of uh, the operator patterns and plumbing there for st uh, storage. Uh, you know specific storage needs. Um, one of my favorites though is the integration testing that we have. We have an entire framework around. Uh, testing storage solutions and storage needs across a variety of Kubernetes clusters, versions, clouds, etc. Um, so all those things are available in a framework for new storage providers to come in, be part of the Rook project, and make it easier to reduce the burden that they have to be running in cloud native environments. Uh, so you can see a whole series of storage providers that the Rook project uh, currently supports, and we'll get into details on those on this slide. So we're going to start with the uh, stable providers. Each one of these storage providers has been declared as stable. So Ceph was actually the first storage provider that uh, Rook started with. The project was kind of founded around doing orchestration for Ceph. Um, Ceph provides you know, uh, three different types of storage, file, block, and object. Um, but it's also really highly scalable, which is has some really nice properties because you know basically anyone in the cluster can figure out where a piece of data should go. You don't have to centralize that information. So that's a really nice uh, kind of offloading uh, from a central bottleneck to make it a very highly scalable solution. Uh, EdgeFS is the second storage provider that made it to a stable declaration ready for use in production. And it is, um, it's kind of, its design is kind of similar to how Git is designed where it's based on immutable blocks. And when you change a block, uh, modifications to blocks are globally unique and they give the block a new identity. And um, those properties, they're kind of uh, set EdgeFS up to be natively designed to be globally scalable, which is great. Uh, this slide, we have both our alpha and beta providers. Um, so these ones are not quite too stable yet, but they are on their way maturing and growing. Cassandra is a and a distributed NoSQL database that's made for large amounts of data. And I like this one especially too because uh, a contributor named Giannis, um, he actually did that for the initial implementation for his master's thesis when he was graduating from uh, graduating with his master's degree. So that was really awesome. Uh, CockroachDB is a highly resilient uh, location aware database, um, which has really cool properties when you have location awareness about where you're running, you can make decisions about where to move data to be closer to clients, uh, where to move data to be, um, you know, to have uh, excellent availability and durability properties, et cetera. So it's a well-designed database and that's also running as a, a Rook storage provider. Uh, NFS, the network file system, you typically uh, use this when you wanna have multiple writers on a shared file system. Uh, that was originally implemented as part of the Google Summer of Code uh, project a couple years ago. And then this summer, there is a new Google Summer of Code participant. His name is Ahmad, and he is making lots of enhancements to NFS this summer. So there's active contributions going on there. And then Yugabyte DB is the newest storage provider. It is, uh, it's a relational database as well. Um, it's designed for multiple regions, um, you know, globally distributed as well. And um, it's set up for you know, very low latency, uh, high, avail high availability, and high scale as well. So we're, we're glad to have Yugabyte part, as, uh, part of Rook as a storage provider as well. So at the end of the day, though, the goal of Rook and all these storage providers that it supports is for persistence, uh, you know, persistence of data for applications, right? So let's start talking about the Kubernetes native integration because Rook is a you know, set of storage orchestrators and a framework for storage in Kubernetes. So let's talk about how it natively integrates there. Um, which brings us to a uh, visual here. So this is uh, an analogy we're setting up here. 
So you can think about, you see this little tugboat here, it's pulling or guiding the big cargo boat there with lots of valuable cargo. So you can think about the cargo boat being a, uh, the data plane, the storage providers, you know, they have a ton of valuable cargo on there and the tugboat is the one that's kind of leading and guiding and steering and orchestrating uh, and managing some of the, the direction that the um, that data plane, that cargo ship is heading in. So keep that analogy in mind as we move forward to the operator pattern. So the operator pattern is fairly common in Kubernetes now, and it's basically uh, you know software automation that sits in a control loop and acts in three phases. Uh, the first is that it observes the uh, current state of the system, the actual state, reality in the cluster, and then it analyzes and says, okay, how is this uh, actual state that I found, how is it different than the desired state that uh, the user says they want for the storage system? And it figures out the delta between those and then acts, the third phase, on taking that delta and continually driving the actual state of the cluster towards the desired state. So it'll keep in a loop and you know, doing this observe, analyze, act, and making sure that the user's desired state is where the cluster is heading at all times. So we take a look at this architecture diagram a little bit under the covers here about how Rook works. Uh, let's work left to left to right. So Cube Control uh, is you know the client interface to Kubernetes API. It talks to the Kubernetes API server there. And you can do things like you know Cube Control create or get uh, storage pools and file storage, et cetera. And then we have the Rook operators that are in the cluster also talking to the Kubernetes API. And so they'll take that desired state of, okay, you want a storage cluster. Uh, I will turn that into a set of uh, deployments and pods and services, config maps, et cetera, and that you know, host the storage daemons on the bottom right there, uh, the storage provider specific daemons like the Ceph monitors um, and OSDs and things like that, or the Cockroach DB instances. Um, so, you know, this is a representation of in the Kubernetes cluster, how it's based on the Kubernetes API and you have a set of operators watching, listening for desired state and manipulating, uh, objects in the cluster to drive that, uh, actual state of the cluster in the storage daemons, the storage provider fabric, uh, towards the desired state that the user wants, which brings us back to our analogy of the big cargo ship there, where the storage provider, the data plane that's hosting or holding a lot of bits and bytes and uh, important data in, for the cluster, and the little rook operators, the tugboats there, that are guiding and steering, um, you know, managing or orchestrating the, the data plane to make sure that's aligned with the desired state that the user has expressed. So now that we've learned about what an operator is doing and we've already heard about custom resource definitions, uh, let's dive into what custom resource definitions even are, and especially at the example of the Rook Ceph operator, let's take a look what they provide to the operator and in the end for you, the user of uh, an operator. So it's kind of like that. If you think of uh, the operator like as the, you know, like a motor turning all the wheels in the end, the um, custom resource definition is basically the parameters for those wheels. Like as an example, let's say for um, Ceph, which version of Ceph you want to have deployed. That would be one parameter and well, it adds up in the end to the whole big uh, thing of a being of a Ceph cluster. And we have those uh, we have those custom objects there. Like if you would go to any Kubernetes cluster which does not have Rookseph installed, you don't have this type available on your Kubernetes cluster. That's what the operator brings with it. It's bringing its custom types for that. And I mentioned parameters with like the wheels and such. You know, like it's um, and. A custom resource definition is basically nothing else. Like if, as you uh, think about maybe like a pod object, like pod YAML, it's in the end nothing different to that. It's a specification where all parameters on how it should look, like in case of a pod, like what image, does it have like readiness, liveness probes, how many, yeah, well, if there are more than one container in it, labels and all those things, those are, those are basically just parameters around it um 
for Kubernetes to know what the whole thing will look like in the end, for the whole part. For Ceph cluster object, it's basically the same. You have a list of parameters, like uh, for the storage part, like what nodes should it use? Should it use all nodes? Should it use all available devices? Uh, is there like a device filter you want to set? And even like more con uh, configuration possibilities. And you know, more and more, like I'm not going into each parameter here, the point being it's basically a big list of parameters, which the operator will take and interpret, and based on that, begin creating and or modifying the existing Rook Ceph cluster, which is running. And to be, go a bit further into the part with like the parameters there, for example, you can specifically uh, give a list of nodes you want to use, and in that part, what uh, devices even to use. And that is the cool thing, thanks to Kubernetes there, we can simply specify our custom object. There's no uh, magic uh, that we need to do there. Um, and it allows us to easily, um, well, provide users with a Ceph cluster in Kubernetes based on those parameters. Um, for Rook Ceph especially there, it's not just a Ceph cluster object. Like there's more around in Ceph as well already. There's for example, the Ceph block pool. We have the API version. It's not like version one or apps slash version one for those people that have run around with Kubernetes already a bit. The kind is not deployment or something. It's Ceph block pool. That's our custom object that the Rook operator is bringing into. We have the normal like metadata, which says that's the name of the object. That's the namespace the object should be created in. And we have the specifications. And in this case, we define the specifications just to say, well, failure domain host, replicated size free, require safe replica size and so on. Um, those are, well, those are Ceph specific parameters, but in the end, you know, operator takes those, uh, takes the specification works it out in terms to uh, basically translate it to Ceph, if you will so, and take care of that for you as the user. Um, to build up from a story there, basically, we have a Ceph cluster object. When we create that, it will, well, it take, will take a few minutes, depending on how fast, like pulling images and all those things are, uh, you have created a Ceph cluster. And we have also gone ahead created a Ceph block pool object, because that will instruct the operator to create a pool, a storage pool, basically, in the Ceph cluster it just created. So, um, that is the part where we should learn how to look into how can we consume the storage. And I can tell you, it's it's pretty simple. It's all, Pretty easy, integratable, thanks to like with the custom resource definitions and all. But the good thing is we don't need customer custom things for everything. <laughs> um, there's, for example, like storage class. Um, the um, it is an object of Kubernetes, like of the native APIs, to put like that, of the storage APIs uh, by default, basically. We specify a name for the storage class. We give it a name, Rook Ceph Block. We tell it's you know some special parameters, some we, we, like where to even look for who's to provision our storage and all, like all this fancy stuff. We don't need to concern ourselves too much with that. Um, but we point it to the like to the right cluster, which is the Rook Ceph cluster we just created, and that it should use the pool replica pool. If you remember, we had created a Ceph Block pool uh, as a headed up as a YAML and it would use this pool then for the storage. So thanks to the storage classes in Kubernetes, now the only thing a user or we need to do, we could go ahead and create a persistent volume claim. We create a persistent volume claim. Well, we give it a cool name. My cool app is probably a, well, pretty cool name. So <laughs> we got that cover. We tell the persistent volume claim which storage class name. In our case, it's the Rook Ceph block one. Tell it what access modes. I'm not going too far into that. It's basically um, telling Kubernetes like what kind of storage it would need to uh, look out for. Like for example, block storage normally can only be used as read-write-one storage, 
which basically means that the storage can only be mounted like this volume there that we get in the end can only be mounted once on one node like not once in the whole life cycle of the volume but meaning that if you have a pod running on node a and you start up a pod on a second pod which also wants to uh, to mount the same uh, block uh, volume like a same persistent volume claim basically there um it won't work unless it's well on the same node but you know it's those kind of edge scenarios still where it wouldn't it wouldn't work out um if it would be on different nodes because the blocks uh, block image normally can only be mounted on one server in read write mode so that's about that there there's also other modes like read write many read uh, read only many as well also but as it we're not going to concern ourselves too much with that right now we're going to set in a persistent way a persistent volume claim also the resources we want in this case we basically request 20 gigabytes of storage um and well after we have created the one we can go ahead in our deployment we have well <laughs> named it my cool app obviously and in the list of volumes we go ahead and specify our persistent volume claim there's well there's a few more tweaks you would want to make to the deployment that you have a flawless uh, way of upgrading like you currently can only run this with a replica of one because if you would have the need to run an application where like each replica, so each pod would have its own persistent volume claim, it would be necessary because, you know, block storage can only be mounted once by one pod, basically. Um, you would need to go ahead and use a stateful set. So this is more just a demonstration purpose here. Purpose here. This, would, uh, this is how uh, like the volumes entry would look. And in the end, you could simply in the container section uh, do a volume mounts on well the name data and say well mount path down there. So um, yeah. So we have our application there basically running. We have one part, and now we're going to dive into the demo. Okay, diving into the demo now. For first part, for Ceph operator, we need to create uh, the common.yaml, all the objects which are in there. In a Kubernetes cluster. So we'll simply do that by, well, and uh, it will really create CRDs, custom resource definitions, RBAC, cluster, which includes cluster roles, role bindings, service counts, and all those things. As next part, we're going to create the operator deployment and the config of uh, the operator. After that, we'll move on to the cluster YAML. I'll show it in a second, but just, you know, it takes a bit of time for everything to spin up. So we'll go into that in a second. We're going to create it. So let's just do a quick, um, okay, containers are already, uh, it's already creating. So that's good. The operator, well, it, you know, it just takes a bit in my, for the cluster I'm using. And let's take a look at the cluster YAML. Um, big note here, the cluster we are currently looking at is, um, is a free node cluster. You have to have at least three nodes if you try, uh, if you like, well, want to try it out with a cluster.yaml. If you want to just play around in a network or like one node cluster, uh, please take a look at the, um, at the cluster, cluster minus test.yaml for that. And, so let's dive right into that. Um, so, this, well, you know, we have a name, name says and all that again. We have the specification, which Ceph version it will use with some additional stuff like data the host path. I would recommend you to read up on like what each uh, part here does in the documentation on rook.io. Um, but you know, as we had it, there's a bunch of parameters which need to be set in a certain way. Most of them have defaults, um, but you should be aware of what the defaults are, especially when you would uh, go ahead and run it in production at one point. So just, yeah, well, you know, we have the whole, the whole um, structure of the self cluster object. So let's just jump back and see how is, how's it looking. Okay, we have a bunch of components already having spawn up. 
the operator in the background is uh, creating all the components we need. We have the mods spinning up. They are a vital part of Ceph. And for production, or as a side note here, you should have at least three months. If you run with less than three months, you're not going to have a, a quorum for the Ceph months. Um, so keep that in mind. But you know, if you want to know learn more, I would check uh, recommend you check out the Rook.io documentation. And depending on what storage backend you want to run, like in case of Ceph, check out the Ceph documentation as well to read up on how the architecture of Ceph is looking. Okay, so. We have the mons now. It is uh, the operator has now started the so-called Rook Ceph OSD prepare pods. They are jobs basically, which are running on each node to um, well create or well not necessarily create but prepare uh, disks in the server for OSDs. So that's what they are doing. And let me just uh, refresh the output here. It has already finished for two of the nodes we have for the master and for the node one here. And we already have even we are so it's already faster uh, than um, anticipated right now. We already have the three OSDs. The OSDs short explanation here, the OSDs are the part which actually save the data to disk there. Now uh, let's run another uh, get to update the output. One prepared uh, job here is still running, but we have our SDs already. It will take, depending on, you know, uh, what, what uh, resources the node has a bit, till all everything is prepared on a node. And as we can see, we just got the next uh, few OSDs. Um, you might be wondering, what can I use as an OSD? You need to have either an empty partition, side note, I would recommend you format the disk as unformatted, May seem weird, but uh, at least in for t to talk about cheap part here, at least in cheap part there's an option to say, hey, this is unformatted. And in the classes I've been setting up, uh, when like uh, even though the partition was empty and it didn't work, after that it worked when I've set them to unformatted. So um, yeah, just a quick tip here if you wanna if you have some trouble getting your partition and or disks recognized even for just the testing part. Okay, so we have our Ceph cluster running now. Um, let me jump ahead uh, to the application deployment in a second. Okay, so now for the application uh, deployment. First thing we sh uh, still need to do is create a storage class and a Ceph block pool as we learned from previous, uh, previous slides. We, uh, there's a pretty convenient example in a CSI slash RBD folder called storage class YAML. As you can see, we just created a Ceph block pool called replica pool and a storage class. So we got that now. So if I run kubectl get storage class, we'll see, there we go, we have a storage class now. Okay, now let's deploy the application. Okay, now after we have created the storage class and with that also Ceph block pool, we can just run kubectl create on our application manifests, which are also in this case as they are deployment objects and a persistent volume claim object. So I'm just gonna create uh, the uh, everything that's needed for that. And we can go ahead, run a keep kettle get part and get PVC minus W so we can watch the whole thing. Oh, we can't do that in the watch mode. Well, let's just wait for the pods uh, to be running. And well, there we have it. If I go ahead and run kubectl get PVC now, well, here we go, let me just zoom out a slight bit here. We see we have two persistent volume claims which we created and both of them are bound. So they have been created in the backend and all and are provisioned and are now ready for use. And as we have seen at the parts, well, they're ready and they're already used in the parts. And well, that's it from the demo with, with ease. Uh, been able to consume the storage after we have created a Ceph cluster. Uh, remember, you, even a testing environment needs to have certain amount of um, resources like disks or something like empty partition or something. Um, yeah. Thanks for that and let's continue. All right, Alex, thank you very much for that uh, 
a helpful demo there to showing us uh, how some of the Rook project works with a little bit more hands-on experience there. Uh, so now we can talk about, um, since Rook is a completely open source project, uh, you know, CNCF project, um, we have a pretty broad community now. And there's a lot of different ways that you can get more involved and become more uh, more involved in the uh, Rook community as a whole. So the main site is Rook.io. That has uh, some more explanation about the project and all of our documentation, user guide, quick starts, etc. is all there. So it's a great place to go if you want to start using the Rook project. And then we're super active on Slack as well. Um, there's the link right there. If you have questions, you can come and find the right channel. And uh, we're a very welcoming bunch. Um, so you come talk to us there. Um, you know, we have over, you know, almost 300 contributors now. We're always looking for more. So on github.com rook slash rook, that is the repo. And you can submit issues, pull requests, uh, have discussions there. Um, and then, uh, of course, we're also on Twitter and we have community meetings uh, every other Tuesday. Uh, the specific links for that is on the uh, readme in the book repo. Um, so, yeah, thanks a lot for listening to us today. And uh, we can I'll just about wrap it up. Thanks, Jared. So, yeah, if you want to get involved, f uh, follow the links. Check out our Slack uh, if you have any questions there, um, especially for KubeCon. We have a channel called Conferences. Um, well, feel free to ask questions. And yeah, thanks for listening, everyone. Have a good day and, well, see you next time, hopefully.